today, no, there we go. No, there. So today we're going to look at the microscope overview, what the differences are between resolution magnification and numerical aperture, why that's important, different contrasting methods, different types of microscopes, good microscopy practice and maintenance, and then I'm going to just run through cool illumination, which is one of the most important things ever. So microscopy started um, when microscopy started, the word microscopy was um, created by the Greeks, where micros means small and scopin means to observe. So essentially putting the two together to observe small things. When we look at a microscope, you will always, always, always have certain components, regardless of which microscope you are working with. This is working with your basic student microscope on a bench or working with your confocal microscope. There's always a light source. There's a field diaphragm. This field diaphragm can either be manual or uh, motorized. You always have a condenser, condenser aperture, objectives. Your objectives and then you have your eyepieces. Some of the mi microscopes these days don't have eyepieces because everything works through the camera and through the photo tube of the microscope. I'm going to start right at the top, uh, right at the bottom with the light source. Um, so you have the light source at the bottom and then you have the field diaphragm. So the functionality of the field diaphragm is to control the area of the sample illuminated, not the intensity of your light. What you are essentially doing by closing off the field diaphragm is you are limiting the amount of information that is available to you through the eyepieces or through the camera. Whenever you get to a microscope and you see this poly, um, polygram, uh, yeah, polygram um, figure, that means that your field diaphragm is closed. What you are essentially doing, looking at the pictures here on the right hand side, if you look at the bottom picture, your field diaphragm is closed off, essentially closing off the, the light to reach your sample. What you want, is, what you want in practice is that your field diaphragm is completely open at all times. Moving forward, we're going one step up to the functionality of your condenser. So the function of the condenser in the name itself, it says that it's condensing something. The condenser's function is to condense the light in such a way and break it together so that it forms a pinnacle point just underneath your sample. So as you can see, that is your, sam your sample slide and the pinnacle point basically reaches the bottom of your sample. The light then refracts and go into the objective. The condenser is extremely important and a lot of people when working with light microscopy or mi light microscopes, a lot of people get this wrong. They do not control the condenser aperture. Controlling the condenser aperture is extremely important because the condenser aperture needs to match the numerical aperture of your objective. I'll show you, but I'll talk about that just now. The when your condenser um, aperture is too closed off for the magnification that you are using or for the numerical aperture of your objective, you will be limiting your information that you receive through the eyepiece. Um, if we look at this picture here at the bottom, the numerical, uh, the condenser aperture is closed off for the objective that is being used. So you can see that there isn't enough light reaching your sample and the area of the sample illuminated is not a lot whereas with this one it is set up correctly 
the points uh, to, as to where the light stops, stops within the pathway of your objective. OK, so the numerical aperture, uh, the ap condenser aperture is correctly set up for the numerical aperture of your objective. As to when you look at this one, this normally happens when your condenser aperture is completely open and you're working with a low end um, or low magnification. So for instance, with a five times magnification, most of your light is being lost because it's not reaching the objective. So you are also in this sense losing information. When this happens, when we look at this particular example, and you look at the diagram at the top, when the condenser aperture is too wide open for the numerical aperture of your objective, you will find that you see a glare in your sample. When it's too closed off, or when the, the condenser aperture is limiting the numerical aperture of your objective, your sample will become darkish. It would, yeah, it would become sort of dark. Um, and a lot of the times when this sort of happens, this happens at a high magnification when your condenser is closed. So at a, for instance, 40 times magnification or 100 times magnification. A lot of you probably have worked with 100 times magnification and put on the oil, and then instead of actually opening up the condenser aperture, you've increased the intensity of the light source. This is the wrong way of doing it because you are, for one, especially when you're working with fluorescent microscopy, increasing the intensity of the light source damages your sample even further. And you're not getting, inf you're not getting any more information from it. OK, so essentially, even with with um, H and E stains, you're damaging your um, your actual slide new sample. So the correct way of doing it, which is the one there here in the middle, is by correctly adjusting the numeric the condenser aperture to suit the numerical aperture of your condenser. And this is maybe a little side note that you can write down for yourself. Um, this is a little trick that I've always, I always t uh, teach my clients. When you look at the numerical aperture of the objective, you use the, you can use the magnification of the objective as an indic, as a percentage. So, say for instance, if you if you don't know where the numerical aperture is or it's not indicated on the objective, especially for instance in a closed box system like the confocal although the confocal does this automatically for you. But in some cases, you won't be able to see the numerical aperture of the objective, so you can use the magnification as a trick. If you use a five times magnification, you open up your condenser 5%. If you, open, uh, if you use 100 times magnification, you open up your condenser 100%. 40 times 40% or 50% for 50 times objective. All right. So just to show you what type of image you'll be able to see down the microscope if this is not the correct, is uh, it's not set up correctly. The image on your left hand side here, that image has been, that image shows you how a diatome should look should the condenser aperture and the numerical aperture of the objective matches. If you look at the inside here of the diatome, you'll see that you can see little triangles as well um, as some other very fine details within this part here. When you look at the image here at the right top, you'll see that you'll, there's a big glare in your sample. This is caused by the condenser aperture being too wide open for the numerical aperture used of uh, used. So for instance, if you use a five times objective and your condenser is completely open, 
you will find that you'll see this little glare here. What you also what you can also see is that all the details inside this in, in the inner side of the diatome is not exactly um, visible. You won't be able you can't really see the nice triangles as you could see in the correctly set up um, image. Um, everything is, is over contrasted, if we can call it that way. If it's too closed off, you'll see that the, you can also everything. It's the, the contrast is there's an extreme contrast, but the amount of detail that you can see from your slide is actually very little in comparison to what you could see if it was set up correctly. That is why it is extremely important to know how to set up your condenser properly. So now I've spoken about the condenser and I've spoken about the numerical aperture of the objective, but where do I find the numerical aperture of the objective? There are a whole bunch of writing on each and every objective, regardless of the make of the objective. So even the Nikon or the Olympus or the Leica objectives, they all have the same writing on them. And I'm going to talk you through from the top to the bottom as to what each and every objective, um, each and every right, uh, piece of information means. Right at the top on the Zeiss objectives, you have the name. So what I usually say when I do this training in person, and um, I know that everybody's mics are now muted, so it's a bit diff It's I'm going to explain the example rather than asking you. When we take clothing brands such as Woolworths and Pep stores, there's certain things that you associate with the brand. For instance, with Woolworths, you associate quality, pricey, you know, price, um, service, so customer service, um, and uh, durability with the product. When it comes to PEP stores, you, ex you associate the same things, but in a different way. You would, you would associate PEP stores with lower quality, cheaper brand, less customer service, for instance. Um, you won't be able to, for instance, take something back to PEP stores two months after buying it, whereas with Woolworths, you would be able to do it and they'll exchange it for you if there's a manufacturing fault with the material. For that reason, it's extremely important for Zeiss to put their brand on the objectives. Um, and what and the reason why they do that is because they would like you as a user to associate the brand with quality um, of the objectives. So Zeiss, there's um, just a little bit of a background story with objectives. There's only two people at Zeiss in the world that knows how to make objectives and how to polish the lenses. With our high-end um, objectives, most of the lenses are hand polished and not machine polished. And it really takes a very a unique skill in order to do that. Which is also why some of the high end objectives are extremely expensive. Then the second thing that you would see here is the name of the objective. The name of the objective tells us what the objective can be used for. For instance, if it's a normal student microscope, it would say A plan or A plan standing for acro plan objectives. If you are using an inverted microscope, the objective will have an LD in front of, for instance, the new fluor. That LD stands for long distance objective because the distance between the objective and the sample is a lot longer than what it would be. Um, than what you would get on a compound microscope, for instance. Plan means an additional lens. Um, additional lenses has been 
in um, has been added to the objective in order to create flatness of the field of view. So that is what the plan means. And then you get, um, for instance, an acro. Acro means that there's additional lenses to correct for chromatic aberration. aberration. So color ab aberration, for instance. And acro objectives corrects for two color aberrations. So green and blue bends back together through the light path. So remember when we work with microscopes and we work with light, I don't know if you remember back in back in school you had a um, a science book where they used a prism to show you what the different colors are when you show shine white light through the prism you get a whole array of different colors exactly that happens between each and every lens within your microscope so then you get apo apochromatic objectives apo means that the objective corrects for three colors, which then gives you the true color of your stains or your fluorescence. Fluoride objectives, such as this one, which is, means new fluor, so new, new means new, and then fluor, meaning that this particular objective is specifically designed for fluorescent applications. Fluorescent applications usually use, you only use one or two colors, so one or two wavelengths at a time. So it corrects specifically for that. In your super resolution objectives for confocal and other resolution techniques, you use new fluor objectives or fluorescent objectives. And it's very specific objectives that has been ex designed for um, confocal microscopy. The next thing that you would see is the magnification. So this is extremely important and the magnification of an objective is always connected to a color band. So this is also something that you could sort of learn by with time and it's a very um, important thing to also learn. The reason being is people tend to touch the objectives and this writing tends to disappear on objectives if the microscope is used quite often. However, the color band usually stays. Um, could I please ask that you just switch off your video cameras, please? Um, so on this side, you'll see that the color coding each magnification goes with the color coding. Your four or five times magnification will always be red. Your 10 times will always be yellow. Your 40 or 50 times will always be light blue. 100 times will always have a white ring. And this is regardless of the brand of the objective. This is standardized across the board. Then next to the magnification, you will have another number. In this case, 1.3. This number is, a, is your numerical aperture. Your numerical aperture is a direct indication of the quality or the resolution of your objective. The higher the numerical aperture for a specific magnification, the better the resolution of a specific magnification. Just to give you a, an idea, your student microscopes that you've worked with at um, in undergrad, the 100 times magnification had a 1.25 numerical aperture. The research microscopes such as the confocal with 100 times magnification has a 1.4 numerical aperture. That slight change in numerical aperture makes a huge difference. Another thing to always remember is when you work with a numerical aperture that is larger than one, you need to use an immersion fluid, either oil, water, glycerin, or some objectives can do all three. In most cases, 
um, you use oil, um, for instance. So now what is the numerical aperture? What does it actually mean? So the numerical aperture is an indication of the size of the front opening of your objective. And I hope that when I say this, that the condenser now makes sense. And why it's important to match the condenser aperture to the numerical aperture of your um, objective. All right. Then we have the DIC. OK, so that DIC can either be DIC, it can either be blank where there's nothing standing there, which then means that it's a bright field objective or a fluorescent objective. Or it could say phase contrast, pH 1, pH 2, pH 3, or it could say DIC. This is an indicator of what this what contrast method this objective is suitable for. Then there's a one millimeter core. One millimeter core means that there's a variation in the thickness of your um, and the focal point. Um, of the, no, sorry. It's a it's an indicator of the yeah of the refractive index that you can use. With core objectives, you can normally use more than one type of immersion fluid. In this case, this objective is set up for glycerin and water applications. So you can change the wheel to state if you are using water immersion or if you're using glycerin immersion. And then you have the blue, um, the blue ring, which indicates your magnification, and then you have a red ring. With your oil objectives, that there would always be a, or a black ring at the bottom. In this case, this objective has been set up for oil, water, and glycerin. This is something that you could see a lot of the times with 100 times magnification, where you'll have a white ring followed by a black ring, which means that your 100 times objective is set up for oil immersion. Oh, where's my arrow? There we go. This ring also gives you. Oh, then another thing. Okay. Um, so we have the core. Then you have the infinity sign. In the past, in 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 history, if you go back in history, when microscopes were designed, the objectives were designed in such a way that light only moved through the condenser and the objective to the eyepiece and that was it that was the only thing that was important the light just had to reach the eyepiece so that you could see what your sample looked like nowadays because of all the technology that we have um, in microscopy such as your apatomes and your lsms and the confocal microscopy and so forth it is extremely important that you have infinity corrected objectives. It's, and this is also important, especially when using a camera. Your light needs to move through your beam path or through the light path. To infinity, there should be no stops. It should not light should not stop at any point through the process because then you're going to lose information. Most objectives from most suppliers these days are all infinity corrected objectives. Then you have a 0 0.19 or 0 0.15. A lot of objectives gives you an indicator, not it doesn't give you the ability to change the 
um, change these numbers, it usually is a 0 0.17, which is the same thickness as a cover slip. This means that your objectives are corrected for that specific refractive index. Your immersion oil that you use with the microscope also has a refractive index of 0 0.17, so that it matches the thickness of the cover slip. In this case, because you are working with glycerin to water, immersion fluids, the thickness of the fluid or the refractive index of the fluids differ. This objective gives you, allows you to change the refractive index um, of your objective in order to match the refractive index of the fluid being used. So this is also something to just take note of when you work with different microscopes and with different samples. All right, so that's a little bit about the objectives. Now, just to quickly show you what's happening inside the objectives with different applications and why the names of an objective really does matter and why it's always important when you want to purchase a microscope to look at the name of the objectives being quoted. The reason being is it gives you a really, really good indication as to what type of objective you are buying and the quality of the objective that you are buying. The student microscopes that you get at your university has Acromat objectives. Acromat objectives is corrected chromatically for blue and red wavelengths and spherically for green, and they have five lenses inside. These lenses are also made with a machine. They are not hand polished. When you go to your fluoride objectives, you have a high transparency, uh, transparency and even the UV range or wavelength range. The contrast, it corrects for contrast and for low um, dispersion and the maximum numerical aperture that you would get for 100 times magnification would be 1.3. And it consists out of seven lenses within the objective. Seeing the difference between the lenses, you can also imagine that there's a quite a big change in the price range of the objectives. And then we also have the plan acrochromat objectives. These are the high end macro um, objectives that you would use, for instance, in confocal microscopy. They consist out of 14 lenses. Chromatically, it corrects for red, green, blue and dark blue. Spherically, it corrects for green and blue wavelengths and has a high transparency and color quality. It's awesome for fluorescence and bright field photo micro, um, micro, micro, micrography. It has an extremely high numerical aperture, so your 100 times objectives would normally get a um, have a numerical aperture of 1.4. And there's some field curvature that you would get, but it's corrected with the plan objectives. So just to give an idea as to price wise, what these objectives does, your chromat objective 10 times will cost you around about 4,000 rand. Your fluoride objective would cost you around about 20 to 30,000 rand and your apochromat will cost you near 100,000 Rand. And that's just for the objective. For this reason, if you ever work with an objective, please do not change the objective by touching the objective on the sides of the lens. A lot of people do this and every time they do it, I cringe and a little piece of my heart dies. The reason being is when you take your fingers and you press on the side of the objective, you are immediately pressing on the lenses inside and shifting these lenses. After a while, these lenses will be shifted and they lose their quality and they will not be able to focus anymore, which means that you need to replace the actual 
objective. For that reason, you are wasting money and throwing money into the water because you didn't take care of your objective. The correct way of changing between objectives on a manual microscope, there's a wheel just above the objectives, which we call the nose piece. It's a no, well on the Zeiss microscopes is either gray or black rings and you use that ring in order to change between objectives. You never touch the actual objective itself. Also, just a note when you want to clean a microscope from oil because you used oil for 100 times or a 63 or a 50 times objective. With the high numerical aperture. Please never use a tissue or a or any sort of um, yeah, a tissue or the, the lens wipes to clean the oil at the bottom. As you can see, there's a lens sitting right at the bottom. When you clean it, you are sand you taking sandpaper basically and rubbing it on this lens. If that lens is damaged, it's damaged and you can throw the objective away. The correct way of cleaning it is by putting a um a lens, a, a lens tissue on the stage and dropping or picking up the stage so it just touches the objective and leave it, leave the objective right there overnight so the paper will then absorb the oil without damaging the lens at the bottom Okay, so we've talked about the objectives right now, and then I just want to show you quickly that you get different microscopes with different purposes. For different purposes. You get transmitted light, and then you get reflected lights. Transmitted light are, user, are usually used for your bright field applications. So if you have your, your histology slides, you'll use bright field or transmitted light. It is usually used for phase contrast and DIC as well. For fluorescence, you need reflected light. And sometimes for polarization, you also need reflected light, depending on what you would like to polarize and the sample that you would like to polarize. But for fluorescence, you have a light source at the top, the light moves through the beam path, you have a mirror inside the fluorescent cube that reflects the light down. The light hits your sample, it goes back into the objective, through the filter, and to your eyepiece or your camera. You will learn more about the fluorescent filters and how fluorescence work in the fluorescent training. That's an I would give you. The reason why I show this to you is that when you want to ever do fault finding, it's important to know which light be, um, pathway you are busy using. If you are using the transmitted light, your light will come from the bottom through your sample, through the objectives to your eyepiece. If you're using the reflected light, the light will come from the top, hits the sample and go back into the objective. That means that if you're working with fluorescence, you shouldn't go and search here at the bottom for the fault if you're doing fault finding. The fault is somewhere here. There's somewhere, something that's not slotted in the correct position, which is why the light is not going through to your eyepiece or to the camera. Okay, so there's three different, there's three very, very, very important things to always consider when you are planning your experiment. First one is what magnification are you going to use? What resolution is necessary for your sample? And what contrast method is um, necessary to for you to view your sample? And a lot of research that, um, especially the lifestyle research, when you want to go and use the confocal, your cells are unstained. They might be marked with fluorescence markers, but they are unstained. So you need a contrasting method of a different sort in order to allocate your cells, for instance. Magnification, we all know what magnification is, but it's the how far and how much your image 
your sample is being magnified. Resolution means resolution is an indication of how much detail you can see separately on your sample. Then you have your contrast. Many microscopes have different um, contrasting methods. And we'll have a look at the different contrasting methods a little later in the presentation. Magnification, how do you work out the total magnification of your system? There's a magnification on your objective, yes, but there's also a magnification on your eyepiece. Your eyepiece magnification can vary. The majority of the time it's 10 times, but it could also be 16 or 25 times. So make sure when you want to work out the total magnification of your sample that you take these two components into consideration. This is also important if you write up your article and you want in your method section, methods section or you, where you describe the instrument that you've used and the magnification that you've used, that you take into consideration which eyepieces have been used. I've read plenty of times in specifications where people say to me, the microscope has a magnification of 2004 2,500 um, times. 2,500 times magnification by implication means that you're using a 25 times eyepiece and 100 times objective. So please take this into consideration. Majority of the time, people either use a 400 times or 1,000 times magnification. So you use 10 times eyepieces, with 100 times mag, um, objective magnification, which then gives you the total of a 1,000 uh, times magnif total magnification. Just to quickly show you, and this image you probably have seen in the past, just to give you an idea as to what is actually happen happening to your sample when you look through it, look at it through the microscope. Here where the object is, this would be your slide that you've added to the microscope. Then you have a distance between the objective and your slide. Depending on the magnification that you use, the higher the magnification, the smaller this distance would be. Then an inverted image is formed at the back of your eyepieces. And this image is extremely large. Then you have your eyepiece. And your eyepiece only magnifies a very tiny proportion of that image being of the magnified image. And that is the image that you then see through your eyepiece or through the eyes. OK. For this reason, it's also really important that you set up the light, so the light and your condenser aperture correctly, because if this image is too dark, you could imagine that the amount of information that you get at this particular point would be very little. Empty magnification versus true magnification. When we work with digitization, it is extremely important that when you take an image, that you take the image at, um, correctly. If you want a overview image, you will use a um, a low magnification objective. A lot of the times what people do is they want to see a bigger field of view at a higher magnification. And what they then do is they take an image at a lower magnification and then they blow up the image. And then you would get a, ph a phenomena that looks more similar to this. You can see absolutely no detail whatsoever. The image means nothing essentially, um, because what you're busy describing in your paper cannot be seen in the images that you've taken. Whereas if you take this image, for instance, you can see a whole bunch of detail. However, you cannot necessarily see the entire diatome as you would like to see it. Um, so Zeiss has created something that we call a tiling where you can take a full image of your sample 
by tiling the images together at a high magnification. This assures that you get the right, um, that this assures that you can still see the detail in your sample and you still get the field of view of your sample. So essentially you can see your entire sample in, um, in context. Resolution. I always explain resolution in the in in this in this way. When you take two laser pointers and you point it at a wall, you will see that there's two red dots on the wall. The resolution is determined by how close you can get those two dots to each other next to each other, still seeing them as two dots. The closer you can get them together, still seeing them as two dots the higher your resolution. I hope that makes sense. The resolution is the least separation of two points in an object which can just be distinguished as being represented by two features in the image. So if you have two cells together, um, add two cells next to each other, how high can you magnify that image by still seeing it as two cells and still seeing the finer details within the object or within the cell? The higher the resolution, the better your images is going to be. As I said previously, your resolution is determined by the numerical aperture of your objective. Numerical aperture is the opening, the front opening at the bottom of your objective. OK. So there's a equation that we use in order to work this out. This is not something that you have to remember. But. Um, well, for instance, has a refractive index. That is the same as the glass cover slip that you use. The higher the magnification, the smaller the distance between the sample. So I'm talking about that distance now. The higher the magnification, the smaller the distance between your sample and the bigger the angle of the light. Which means that the higher the numerical aperture. And then I just want to say, remember. That the numerical aperture is an indication of the size of the opening in the objective itself. So here I show you two images. On the left hand side, the image has been taken, an overview image has been taken of a diatome at a 10 times objective magnification with a numerical aperture of 0.1. As you can see in this image, you cannot see much detail. You can see the outlines of the figure, but you of the diatome, but you cannot see the inner details of the diatome itself. Whereas on the right hand side, the image has been taken at a higher magnification, so 100 times objective magnification, with a numerical aperture of 1.3. In this image, you can now all of a sudden see all the details. This has nothing to do with the with the magnification as per se, but it is a direct representation of the numerical aperture. The higher the numerical aperture, the better your resolution. As I mentioned to you, when you want to um, design your um, your experiment, and this is something we'll speak to you about on Friday as well, and we'll mention this as well. Your contrasting methods that you would be using is extremely important. When imaging specimens in an optical microscope, the difference in intensity and or color creates the image contrast, which allows the individual features and details of the specimen to become visible. If I add, for instance, a onion skin underneath on a microscope slide and I do not dye it, I won't be able to see it without using, for instance, phase contrast. The same with, um, with um, 
human cells or mouse cells. It is essentially transparent. For Brightfield applications, we use H and E staining, which is the simplest contrasting method that is being used in science today. Then we have dark field. So what dark field essentially does is it takes away all the light that is going to the sample. So you would see that that's your objective and your sample will basically lay here. The only light that hits the sample when you use dark field illumination is stray light. So the light that goes past your objective. And the difference between imaging is the following that you could see on the right hand side here. The image at the top is done with um, bright field where you can't really see the cells. You can see something's there, but you can't really see what. And then you use dark field illumination and all of a sudden you can see the outlines of the cells. Phase contrast is one of the mo is one of the contrasting methods used um, the most often um, besides for bright field applications. Inside the objective, there's a faint co phase contrasting ring, and there's also a phase contrast ring inside the condenser. When you take the phase contrast rings and you overlap them with each other, you will get something that looks like this. All of a sudden, your cells will have a greenish halo around them. There's a specific reason why it's greenish, or bluish, and not, for instance, red. At the top here, you can see that this image has been taken with bright field illumination, where you can't see a lot of detail of what's going on inside the cell. And yet at the bottom, all of a sudden, everything that's happening inside the cell, like the cell nuclei, can be seen in greater detail. It is important that when you work with phase contrast that you align the correct phase contrast rings with each other. On the objective, next to your, as I mentioned earlier, you'll get the magnification, then the numerical aperture, and then it would state which contrasting method um, the objective is suitable for. So in this case, when using phase contrast, it would show you phase one, pH one, pH two, pH three. pH, say for instance, you're using a low magnification objective, like a 10 times objective. 10 times objectives are normally pH one, or phase contrast ring one. The one, two, three is an indication of the size of the ring. All right. In the condenser, you will then also have an indication, the same indicators um, on the modular disk of the condenser. It is important that you match the phase rings in the, that you match the condenser phase contrast ring that's inside the condenser with the correct, um, with the, the objective. Once you've done that, you'll get an image that looks like this or it is. So why exactly is the why exactly is the halo around the cells it's blue a blue greenish um, wavelength or halo? When you work with a phase contrast ring, the ring itself actually slows down the wavelength, crazy, uh, creating a phase difference between your wavelengths, which then results into um, a phase shift. And the only light that comes through is your blue and your green wavelengths, which then creates the halo around the cells. So it's the only light wavelength that actually hits the cells at the end of the day. 
If you would like to know a lot more and about this in greater detail, I'll show you afterwards where to find more information regarding this. Then we have DIC. DIC is, works more or less on the same principle, but DIC can be used to look at the surface of your cells. Then we have polarization. So polarization is a lot of the time used for looking at different crystals and the crystal colors will then give you an indication as to what type of um, uh, material you are working with, or what type of mineral you are working with, which is what polarization are normally used for. In a lot of biological um, applications, polarization is also um, used to minimize reflection. So if you're working with like, for instance, a water sample or sample that reflects, a, that has a lot of reflection, you can use polarization to minimize the reflection from your sample. Then we have fluorescence and this we will go into more greater detail later in the week. So the different types of microscopes that you get, as I've explained it to you, you get compound stereos and inverted microscopes. With your compound microscopes, you get different grades of microscopes. So they start with your normal student microscope and they go all the way up to a completely motorized system. The same happens with the stereo microscopes. With stereo microscopy, you also get two different types of technologies. You get CMO design technology and Gringo technology. Um, for today, I'm not going to go into what the differences are between these two, but this will be handled in a um, presentation um, webinar that Zeiss will be hosting later in August. And then you have your inverted microscopes. Inverted microscopes are basically a compound microscope that has been turned around. So you still have your light source still have your condenser, you have your stage, you have your objectives, and then you have your eyepieces. If you work with fluorescence, you have your light source here at the back, like for instance in this particular model, light source at the back, it goes through the objective, it hits your sample from the bottom, goes back into the objective to your eyepiece. So your light beam paths stay exactly the same. And these microscopes also vary from completely manual systems to completely motorized systems. So good microscopy practice, something to really remember every time you step in front of a microscope. There are certain things that you need to check and certain things that needs to be done before you look at your sample. Firstly, you need to sit comfortably. You cannot slouch because you're going to get a back pain and you cannot stretch your neck like a giraffe because you are going to hurt your neck and your neck is going to go into spasm. Usually you spend quite a few hours in front of a microscope. So if you ever walk away from a microscope with a stiff back or neck, please make sure that you've, you adjust the seat uh, correctly the next time. You select your 10 times objective and you zero the instrument and focus on the sample. You check your cool illumination. You check if your sample is coolly illuminated, if the entire if your entire microscope is correctly aligned. You in adjust the interocular distance and you focus the eyepieces. Guys, if you wear glasses, please, please make sure that you know what your perspective prescription says. Your eyepieces on any microscope can be adjusted to the prescription of your glasses. You cannot work with glasses on a microscope. The reason being is that the focus point of your, um, between the eyepiece and your eye, um, your, um, your pupil is altered. Normally, the distance between the eyepiece and your pupil needs to be around about one centimeter. If you wear glasses, you alter that distance, which means that you're going to have a hard time actually focusing um, and, and seeing your sample. 
So make sure that when you sit in front of a microscope that your eyepieces are set up correctly for your ocular um, prescription. If you have 2020 vision, please make sure that the eyepieces are sent are um, correctly set up. There is on the Zeiss eyepieces, there is a white ring, a white dot, and then there's a little stripe with a zero on it. Make sure that the zero stripe, the zero is in line with the white dot. If that happens, then your eyepieces is correctly set up. If not, the eyepieces, um, you will get a headache. So if you ever sit in front of a microscope and you walk away with a headache, your eyes have worked way too hard in order to focus the whole time while you're busy working on the microscope. So relax your eyes and set up the eyepieces correctly. Align the microscope and ask for help if you get stuck. Some microscopes, especially the motorized microscopes, are already aligned. So please do not fiddle with the microscope components on a motorized microscope. On a manual microscope, it is important to, to check this because you can set it up correctly before starting to work, making sure that there's no altercations in the beam path whilst you're working on the microscope. Be diligent to adjust the condenser aperture settings according to the numerical aperture of your objective. And be aware to, to, of swinging your 40 times objective into the oil. 40 times objectives do not like oil. If ever you do perhaps by accident um, get oil on the 40 times objective, Please ask the lab manager to get it to clean it for you or call the Zeiss spam engineers to come and clean it for you immediately and please report it. If the 40 times objective um, gets oil and the oil insert enters the objective at the bottom, the 40 times objective can be thrown away. We cannot clean it, so you'll have to get a new one. OK, so please just be diligent about that and be careful um, and make sure that you report it when that does happen. OK, so microscope maintenance. Always remember to put on the dust cover of your microscope after you've used it. Do not mix immersion oil media. So if you've started with a specific brand of immersion oil, please do continue with that specific brand's immersion oil. Do not switch between brands. There is very cheap immersion oils on the markets that you can use. They are not necessarily really good immersion oils. The quality of an immersion oil is determined by the viscosity of the oil itself and the runniness, basically meaning the runniness of the oil. You do not want an oil that runs because that oil will then run onto your condenser lens and onto your objectives. You do not want that. So make sure that you use a high quality immersion oil when you use when you do microscopy. Inverted systems are more prone to collecting dust, so please cover them. Avoid touching the optics with your bare skin. The reason why we say that is that your skin has oil on it. So when your fingers have oil on it, so if you touch it, you are transmitting a uh, you know, transmitting the oil onto the onto the lens and dirt, making the lens dirty. Avoid leaving internal components exposed for longer than required. So if you are taking out an eyepiece or you take off the camera and exchange it for a different one, please do so quickly because um, if dust particles go into the microscope, it's extremely hard to clean um, if we can clean it. If you want to clean an op your optics, so for instance the eyepieces, please never use eye um, earbuds because they contain glue and putting it into the, the cleaning liquid dissolves the actual glue and then you um, put the glue onto the uh, lens. Use a cotton a cotton wool, so you can get cotton wool from in clicks or discount pharmacies. Lisa probably does have some of these um, 
in a lab, so please do ask her and don't try this on your own. These are normally only done by the service engineers who's been factory trained. Um, if ever you want to clean an object, uh, an eyepiece, because it's dirty, never do a zigzag motion, always work it from the inside outwards in a circular motion. Full illumination. I see I'm a little bit over the time, guys, but I'll um, be done within the next 10 minutes. Cool illumination. As I've already told you, cool illumination is extremely important. It was designed by Argus Cooler, which is why it's called cool illumination. And basically, it means that you are centering and aligning your entire microscope. Um, I will send Lisa a diagram which shows you how to do cool illumination on a compound microscope. If ever you would like one for an inverted microscope, please let me know so I can send it to you. Um, so how to set up your cool illumination? I will go through the images to show you um, and not this writing. OK, so firstly, you move the condenser to the upper position and switch in the front lens to set the condenser turret for the bright field application. You choose the 10 times objective and you focus your specimen. Um, my, me, mm, now that I mentioned this, a lot of time what I also see instead of people using phase contrast, they tend to drop the condenser in order to create an illusion of contrast. This is the wrong way of doing it because essentially what is hitting your sample at the end of the day is not focused light. It is basically just stray light. So you're losing information by doing it that way. All right, back to cool illumination. The second step is to close off the field diaphragm. Now you can remember right at the beginning I said to you that the field diaphragm is there to um, is not there to control the area. It's control to control the area illuminated. It's not there to control the intensity of the light. Now, this is the reason why you use why there is a field stop or field diaphragm in a microscope. It's to center your microscope. So you will close off the field diaphragm until you see a polygon figure. In your microscope. Then what you would do is you will move this polygon by moving the condenser. So on each side of the condenser, there should be a pin or at the back of the condenser, there will be pins that you can use in order to center the condenser. When the condenser is then centered after playing around, guys, this does take a bit of practice, so um, Normally, the lab managers do know how to do this. All right, um, you center the condenser until the polygon is in the middle of your field of view, and then you open up your field stop so that you have an unrestricted field of view, and you can see your entire sample perfectly. And that is it for me. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Um, I am going to answer any questions now. So if you have any questions, you're welcome to post them in the message box. Or you can unmute, put up your hand and unmute your screen if you want to. Thank you. Thank um, you. Um, um, don't know don't why I'm giving. But, um, but um, I, would I would like, like to, to say thank you. There are two questions, questions already. already. Yes. The one the from one Martin from and then one from Robert Lufu. So um, Martin, would you like to pose your question or should we read it off? Martin? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, my question was just about the magnification. If the total magnification is the the eyepiece times the objective in a microscope such as at Pellenbosch, when you move to the camera, how do yes. you 
how does the total magnification work then? Is on that microscope, is the objective, does it not add any magnification? Is it just one times? Or, you know, when you switch from the eyepiece to the camera, um, how does this kind of calculation of multiplying the eyepiece times the objective work? Does the camera have an objective, uh, a magnification? Or, yeah, uh, my question is about the, the magnification when using the camera. That's a very good question to ask. So when you um, when you want to work out the total magnification of the camera, things get a little bit more complicated than just um, uh, making a simple calculation. All right. So each and every camera has a camera adapter. Each and every camera adapter has its own magnification. So we have, for instance, three different camera adapter magnifications, either 0 0.5, a 0 0.63, or a one times magnification. Depending on the microscope and the camera that you use, this will differ. So this is something that you need to take into consideration. The eyepiece then becomes absolute. So you won't, because the, the beam pass and your, your image is not going through the eyepiece, you take away the magnification and does not you don't include the eyepiece magnification into your equation so what you then would do is you'll take the magnification of your objective times it by the magnification of the camera and then you'll get the total magnification of your, of your uh, Please, Mike. thank you um so but now this this is the simple the simple answer however now you also do get a digital um built in a, a built-in digital magnifier magnifier so and that part is extremely difficult because that part really determine is it, it depends on the camera that you use so when you want to work out the magnification of the total magnification of your image, for that reason, we normally don't, you don't necessarily stipulate what the total magnification of your system is, but you rather stipulate which camera you use and which objective you use, instead of stipulating the total magnification of the system. And if you work with the software that um, with the software that is provided with the camera, the software algorithms are designed in such a way that it actually take that into consideration. So the magnification that you would get for instance, or the, the, the indication of a scale bar, for instance, that you would get on uh, put onto your image will take that that difference in magnification into consideration. I hope that I answer your question. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Pleasure. Robert asked us, um, how does one decide on the type of immersion fluid, water, oil, glycerin, etc.? Do you quickly want to answer that? Yes, um, OK, so depending, this is something that whenever you want to buy a microscope, this is something that we discuss with you beforehand. It depends, for instance, in your um, sample preparation that you would be doing. Because you're not necessarily purchasing a microscope for your application, for your specific application, you will consider what instrumentation is, avail is available to you. And the type of immersion that you would choose will depend on the objective that, ha that is um, available on the instrument. So, for instance, um, if you there's a lot of clients, for instance, that work with water samples um, at, for instance, Cape Town um, Scientific Services, they do a lot of water samples. So for them, essentially, if they want to emerge the objective into the sample in order to look at something, will give them a water immersion objective, which is very, very specific objective specific for that application. Um, but that's basically how you would determine, how we would determine what type of objective you would be using. It all determines, uh, it all depends on the, on the sample and what, and the research that you would like to do. Um, and this is a discussion that we have with you 
once you want to purchase a microscope, for instance. And this is maybe a discussion that you can have with your lab manager as well to find out um, and to discuss your sample preparation with them and say, this is what I want to do, this is where I want to go, and this is what I want to view and what results I would like. Um, and they can say, yes, OK, so this is the instrumentation that we have available for you, and it uses, say, for instance, water immersion or oil immersion or glycerine immersion, which is, which is determined by the objective that they have on the system. Do I answer right. the question? <laughs> I think so, and from my side, um, I think if we can stop the questions there, I know there's there are a few here um, about um, the scale bar, etc. But per perhaps we can leave the, these questions till the end. Um, if you've seen some of the the next um, uh, lectures, etc., so um, we will attend some of these maybe later on. I am recording all of this, and I will share it with you um, after each. Um, webinar. So we are going to log in again on Wednesday. I will open up the Teams meeting about 10 minutes beforehand so that you can log in and see if you can record um, your you have connection problems. Anya, thank you very, very much for a very informative lecture. I, as an experienced microscopist, there are still things that I've learned today that I didn't know before. Things you just think you don't need to know because you are using the microscope, but Every little thing that you learn about the microscope helps you to improve your imaging. So thank you very, very much for your time. We appreciate it. It's such a pleasure. Um, just one last point from me. Sorry, I posted it into the message chat box now as well. If you would like any more information and more in-depth information, you're welcome to visit the Zeiss campus, online campus. Um, it is available and it's open source, so anybody can visit it, and you're welcome to go and read up more there regarding all the um the contrasting methods and how they actually work so there's a lot of no, a lot more information available to you there right thank you Lisa. thank you everyone we will um i will send out the info the invite again j before wednesday's meeting and um we'll see you wednesday then thank you very much bye bye, bye. Everyone.